Good evening and welcome to our Globe and Mail Virtual Book Club. I'm uh, Patrick Dell. I'm a uh, visual editor at the Globe and Mail and uh, I'll be driving the stream tonight from uh, my virtual library in Toronto. We'll be joining uh, our important guests uh, very shortly, uh, but first we need to do a little bit of housekeeping keeping, and some ground rules. Uh, we're on Facebook, uh, YouTube and Twitter the, this evening. Welcome, whatever platform you're on, it's great to have you joining us. Please let us know where you're in the world. Where in the world you're watching us? Uh, love to know uh, what part of the world you're in. If you have a question for Kathy, please pop that in the comments, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before 9 p.m. Eastern. If you are a troll or you are using offensive language, making personal attacks, making off-topic comments, uh, you'll be warned. And if you keep it up in comments, you'll be muted. Uh, but without any further ado, uh, we should get over to our main guests for this evening, which is in Vancouver. We have Marshall Edelman, the Globe's uh, Western Arts Correspondent. And in, uh, let me check, it is North, uh, no, South Carolina. It's Kathy Rikes. Good evening to you both. How is everyone this evening? Good, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Did we get the right Carolina, Kathy? Yes, this is South Carolina. It's very confusing. <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, uh, Wonderful. I'm going to uh, step away and let you guys uh, carry on with the conversation. I'm driving the software here, uh, so I'm looking away from the camera from time to time. Uh, and I'll be back at the end to wrap up. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. And please, any, anyone watching, pop your comments, uh, pop your questions in comments, and we'll see what we can do with getting to as many as we can. Marsha, over to you. Thanks so much, Patrick. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm joining you from Vancouver, as Patrick mentioned, uh, which is on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. And Kathy is joining us from South Carolina. <laughs> not North Carolina. <laughs> Welcome, Kathy. I feel like I've been in your head for the last few days, so it's really great to see you in nice. this way. Um, and I, I want to thank everyone who's written in with questions, and we will get to them in a few minutes, uh, and we'll be taking questions uh, throughout the hour, uh, as Patrick uh, mentioned. So I could spend this entire hour listing your CV, Kathy, but I feel like that wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, so I've, I've shortened it. Uh, <laughs> really shortened it. Uh, Kathy Rikes was born in Chicago, where uh, if we skip right ahead uh, quite a few years, she received her PhD in physical anthropology from Northwestern University. Uh, she now divides her time between Montreal and North and South Carolina. She is a forensic anthropologist and a professor whose work has included testifying at genocide trials, recovering remains from the World Trade Center site, and identifying remains from previous wars. She has written scientific studies and textbooks, and then Dr. Reichs thought she'd try her hand at fiction. Uh, she published her first novel, Deja Dead, in 1997. It was an award winner and a bestseller, and thus was born Temperance Brennan and a new career for Kathy Reichs. Uh, the series was adapted for television as the show Bones. It ran for 12 seasons. Kathy was a producer on the series. And there's another Canadian connection. The showrunner was Hart Hansen, who uh, went to UBC here in Vancouver. A Conspiracy of Bones is the 19th novel in this series and the one we'll be focusing on today. In the book, Tempe is on the outs with her new boss. She decides to go rogue and investigate the discovery of a body Body that was found with no identification and no face. The man's face, along with other parts of his body, uh, has been eaten by feral pigs. So there's there's a good way to get into it. Um, but you know, first first things first. Before we get to the feral pigs, Kathy, how how are you doing? Uh, how are you uh, managing at this strange time in history? Well, I'm self isolating at my beach house, which is on one of the barrier islands off Charleston, with my two daughters, four grandkids, two dogs, two cats, and a bearded dragon. So it's a little busy here. <laughs> the bearded dragon is, is not a nickname for a person. It's actually... It's a lizard. An animal. It's a yeah, lizard. His name okay. is Spike. He's very undemanding. 
<laughs> so are you able to get any writing done in that kind of situation? Yes, we have a routine. Life has kind of fallen into a, a routine. Um, in the mornings, I write every morning as I normally would do. And the kids have school. Uh, so while their moms homeschool them, <clears throat> um, I write. And then, I don't know, around one or two, we kind of get together, maybe go for a long walk on the beach or just go out to the beach and, you know, swim, whatever. I don't. The kids swim. Um, you know, and then we have big communal dinners. We, we cook and then we have a big dinner together. And then in the evenings, we've been seeing very many kid movies or playing board games or card games or whatever. Any favorite kid movies out of this experience? Oh, we just watched Back to the Future. That was like oh, great. To the, you know, Back to the Past. That was fun. Fantastic. Uh, and how many hours a day are you writing? I write from, I don't know, around 8, 8.30 to 1, 1 1.30, maybe 2. <clears throat> Fantastic. All right. Um, do, you, do you see your work in the future maybe tackling this time in our history? Is, is the pandemic weaving its way into, the, into what you're writing right now? Well, interestingly, I started this book, book number 20 is what I'm writing. And I started that, I don't know, six months ago. And indirectly, it deals with um, not a pandemic, but an infectious disease uh, that gets out of control. Oh, so we have you to blame for this. Yes, you know. <laughs> All right. So when you wrote uh, A Conspiracy of Bones, which was, I guess, a couple of years ago, I'm going to assume that you did not imagine that it would be launched into the world in the midst of a global pandemic. But it is strangely resonant because a, a key central theme is what is real, what is not. These conspiracy theorists who are spouting ludicrous theories about, among some things, vaccinations. Um, where did the idea to dive into that weird world of conspiracy come from? Well, I think you put your finger on it. We're, we're inundated with all of this ludicrous disinformation and misinformation. Anybody can get on the internet or put up a blog or, you know, have a radio station and say anything they, or people in authority. It's not just, you know, wing nuts can say anything they want. So how does the average person sort through all of that and figure out what is real and what is not real? So um, that's kind of the theme of the book on two levels. Um, on the broader level for, for the average citizen. How do you figure out what's real and what's not? How do I sort through all of this? And then for Tempe as well, because for the first, she's has some health issues. And for the first time ever for her, she can't completely trust her own perceptions. So she's having to deal with, well, what's real and what's not real. And at one point in the story, she loses all of her physical evidence. She loses her laptop, there's a fire. So the only thing she has left to rely on is what's in her head and she can't fully trust what's in her own head. We may have lost Marsha. Yep, it looks like we may have lost Marsha. Um, let me just uh, try and get her back. I think she dropped and she was calling me, but I didn't realize uh, that she was heard calling me uh, on the call. Sorry about that, uh, Kathy. You know how the vagaries of technology can go sometimes. I'm back. Can uh, you see me? Let me just check Marsha. Just. Me. Just a, just a moment. Yes, I can I can see you, Marsha. Let me just uh, make sure things are operating the way uh, the way they should be. Uh, there we are. Everyone's back. What did I miss? Uh, you were you were you were missing uh, Kathy. Just uh, <laughs> wrapping up uh, that wrapping that up. Uh, Marsha, I'll I'll throw it back to you, and you can uh, keep going with the conversation. Thanks. Okay. Well, let's hope that I I you know if I were a conspiracy theorist, I'd think that That's that it. blip might not that, have been that was sinister unquestionably yeah i did a right before this i did a facebook live with australia and it just went totally black at one point and everybody no, no. Had to, i had to log back in and technology you gotta love it right I have to say I was slightly panicked, but I reminded myself, don't swear, just in case yes. you're actually still on this, uh, this call. Okay, so um, 
did you talk about navigating the dark web at all? No, we didn't. That's one of the things that comes up in this book. Um, I did a lot of research on the dark web. I went down into the dark web is just the part of the web, which is massively enormous, much larger than the surface web. Uh, but you can't get down there with your regular browsers. You have to have a special browser, the Tor browser, for example, to get down there. So I downloaded that, and I did go down, and I did prowl around um, on the dark web. If anyone ever confiscates my computer, I could be in big trouble. <laughs> so how dark is it down there? There's some dark places. Down, a lot of them you need um, passwords, and, you know, it's encrypted. You need to, or you need a password to get in, so... Uh, but it helped inform what you wrote, obviously. Yes, yes. So in the novel, Tempe is dealing with a medical condition, um, an unruptured cerebral aneurysm. She has surgery, uh, and that has some other effects. And then in the afterward, you reveal that you too have been dealing with this medical condition and the, that you underwent surgery for it. Um, I think we're very used to having you borrow from your work life for these novels, right. uh, but this felt like a new level of uh, a personal loan from your own life uh, and that you gave to Tempe. Um, why did you decide to share this condition with your protagonist and then share it with your readers? Yeah, I just thought it would be an interesting, I wanted her to have a problem, a new problem. She's always got problems, but I wanted her to have a new problem. And I just thought this went along with this theme of what's real and what's not real. And it's very personal for her. Um, I did, I was diagnosed with an unerupted, an un ruptured cerebral aneurysm a few years ago and we monitored it and, and it was just serendipitous there were no symptoms they just were looking at something else and they said no no that's fine but by the way you have this little bubble on one of your um posterior ascending arteries in your head so we monitored it and then after a few years and nothing changed nothing changed and then after a few years there was a minor change and they said well we'll just what they do is they go in and they they just put some little tiny platinum, I think, coils in to it, and it just blocks it off. So it's totally a non-event. Well, but for Tempe, she is having issues post-surgically, and she's having to take medications. She's having migraines, and she can't always rely on what she remembers as a result of that. Has that happened to you? No. Mine, I had the surgery. It was fine. I'm fine. But I she, wanted, to, yeah, I wanted to make it a little tougher for her. So, yeah. And her, her mother uh, remarks that she's become distracted and agitated, short tempered, antisocial. None, none of that's happened to you. You're, you're still I don't think light so. and happy. You'd have to ask my friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll believe you. Um, um, She's also dealing with a lot of change in this book, not just her own medical situation, but the death of her beloved boss, a new boss she doesn't get along with, um, and some other moves. Um, and she says that she doesn't like change. So I wondered about you, because you have brought so much change so deliberately into your own life. How do you feel about change? Well, I don't really like change. Maybe that's a sign. And Tempe says the same thing. Maybe that's a sign of getting old. You know, I don't like change. I like change if I can control it, I guess. I just don't like it when it's, you know, dropped on me suddenly. And she doesn't either. Um, yeah, so... She has had, she's got some changes going on. She's agreed to live with Andrew Ryan, her on again, off again, forever detective from Montreal. So she's had an addition built at, at her home in Charlotte and they bought a condo together in Montreal. So she's a little tense about that. Um, there is a new boss in town. Uh, we read about this in um, a short story that I wrote uh, it's part of a collection called The Bone Collection. And in it, it's called, it's an origin story, um, both for her and for me, how we got into forensic anthropology. But we learn in that story that her longtime boss, Tim Larrabee, in the Charlotte Medical Examiner office, is murdered. So there's a new boss in town, a woman named Margot Hebner, and she and Tempe have history. 
Tempe made some comments about her in the past, and this woman has never forgiven her. And she's the boss now, and she has sworn she'll never call Tempe in for as a consultant. But that doesn't stop Tempe from calling herself in. <laughs> exactly, because I think when this faceless man shows up, um, it's kind of symbolic for her of all the faceless dead that she is committed to helping. To Someone's missing them somewhere out there and to getting them identified, getting them back to their families. So he's kind of sim symbolic of that for her. So she decides, even though Hebner's not gonna call her in, she's gonna work on this case anyway. But she's having to do it outside the system and rely on her own resources and her own network. I think she says at some point that she wonders if this new recklessness is a result of a new awareness of her own mortality. Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility. So she's, uh, she's taking some risks in this one. She's taking more risks than she normally would. Um, and it may be the fact that, that she's thinking about her own mortality, even though she's a long way. I mean, she's, it's surgically corrected. She's fine. But still, her mother keeps bringing it up, as our mothers will do, that, you know, you've got this little bubble in your brain and it's going to explode. And so you need to take everything easy. That would be, uh, you know, slightly concerning to live with, um, especially if you're a little bit on the neurotic side, uh, which you are not. But Tempe might be well, a little. She's very passionate about things that, that, you know, if she wants to do something and wants to become involved in a case and wants to get this faceless man identified, she's going to do it. She's committed. So... I'd like to talk about Margot for a bit, Margot Hefner. She has uh, written a book and she has um, revealed some inappropriate information in media interviews. She's very much uh, dying for the limelight. Maybe dying isn't the right word, but you know, she, she craves it. Uh, and this is very different, obviously, from how you have handled your second career. You have taken great pains to avoid crossing any ethical lines. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you uh, borrowed from your own very careful plotting of your uh, two work lives and, uh, and use that in your Margot storyline. She's... Um... Yeah, I guess. I'm I'm very happy to talk to the media um, when it comes to the books, when it comes to fiction and the stories that I write. Then I write murder mysteries, you know, good old fashioned murder mysteries. They're just science driven. I do not talk, <clears throat> excuse me, do not talk to the press when I'm working on a case because until a case is fully completed, fully um, litigated, um, I don't want to compromise it in any way. So I'm not willing to talk about my cases. And Tempe feels that way too. And as you say, this woman, Margot Hevner, years ago did an interview with this uh, nutcase conspiracy theorist, Nick Body, and um, <clears throat> runs a site called Body Language. And uh, she revealed things about a child homicide that she should not have revealed. And she also went along with his anti-vaccination rant. That, and, and she's a medical doctor and she didn't make any comments. So those are things Tempe couldn't forgive. She was asked her opinion of Hevner's interviews and she gave it. So fast forward six years and Hevner is now the new, the new director of the lab in Charlotte. And um, she's not going to forgive that. Uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is uh, Project MK Ultra, which was this CIA mind control program um, that has a connection to Montreal. Can you talk a little bit about that? It was a project. Um, it was back in the, I forget what, what the year, the span was. I think it only ended in... Uh, what I'm not going to say, because I don't remember. I knew at the time I did all the research. It maybe only ended in the... It was in the back in the 60s or 70s. Uh, people were given uh, various uh, drugs and they were subjected to various forms of mind control modification. It was a way to develop techniques to be used on enemy uh, soldiers, enemy troops, to get them to, to, to reveal information. Um, so people in Montreal still talk about it. Um, it went on there. It went on at many, many different 
places um, with the, you know, the consent and cooperation of the people at the various hospitals and institutions, universities, where these experiments were, were carried out. Um, <clears throat> but it's one of the types of, and there are a lot of conspiracy theories concerned with that and, and a lot of other things. And I did a lot of research into various conspiracy theories because that's one of the sub themes of the book. When you come across a conspiracy theory, uh, in particular, I'm thinking of 9-11 because you were at the World Trade Center after that happened. Does it make your blood boil? Like, how do you deal with that personally? You have to just ignore it. Yes, of course, it makes your blood boil. And some of these theories are so outrageously ridiculous that you can't imagine how anybody could could believe it. And yet there are any number of these things floating around out there and websites where people can go and, you know, talk about the fact that, uh, uh, I don't know, JFK was not assassinated. He's still alive and living in a motel or something. <clears throat> people believe these things. It's crazy. Is he with Elvis by any chance? Yes, he and Elvis. I think somebody made a movie about that, actually. I apologize. I apologize for the siren, by the way. It was well-timed. It was well-timed. Uh, my cat is coughing up something in the background here, so I'm a little distracted by listening to that. Um, but some of them are just silly. They're just ridiculously laughable silly, but some of them are dangerous. If people Like anti-vaccination is dangerous. Uh, yeah, so... Well, it's dangerous right now. This is why it's so, I mean, you never want uh, a, a tragedy to be happening to help promote your book, but it's really good to be having this conversation, I think, about this yeah. right now. Yeah, people need to be very selective in what they read and hear and, you know, think it through, think about it, be a critical listener, critical reader. You refer in your book to the mess in Washington, very vague, not specific, uh, but there are also references to recent mass shootings, to the California wildfires, uh, voter fraud in the last election. Um, I'm wondering to what extent the current U.S. administration informed the uh, writing of this novel. Um, it certainly inspired it. <laughs> so, here we have some classic examples of... Uh, misinformation or disinformation <clears throat> that can be dangerous. Is that hard? I mean, you're in the South. Uh, you've, you, it's a different kind of, it's a different world than Montreal politically. He, well, yeah, it is. It is. But I, I think there are also uh, people who have these kinds of blogs and websites in Canada as well. I don't think it's uniquely an American tradition. True, but uh, our leaders aren't suggesting we inject bleach. Uh, there is currently. that. <laughs> do it. Don't do it. Okay, thank you. I, I concur. Do not inject bleach. <laughs> Um, Tempe talks about immersing herself in her Quebec life as a sort of antidote uh, to everything that she's dealing with in, in the South. Um, how does your Quebec life serve as an antidote to the rest of your life, if it does? It's very different. Um, I love that difference. Um, that's why I've commuted. I'm not doing casework anymore. Um, there <clears throat> excuse me, came a point where I was writing an adult book every year, writing a young adult book every year, and writing a screenplay for the show. So it, something had to go. So I haven't been doing casework for several years. I still go to Montreal regularly, though, um, and visit friends. I stay with friends. And, um, you know, I have to have a dose every now and then because I miss it. Um, I was just answering some questions, I think, for the Globe and Mail today. And they said, what do you miss most? And I said, the restaurants. And the next question was, what does Tempe miss most? The restaurants. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I love That was me. Okay. That was me asking you those questions, okay. by the way. <laughs> so, uh, yes, and those restaurants uh, and I guess the street life, right? I mean, I miss that being out in Vancouver. I miss, well, we all miss it right now. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the, the heat in this, uh, in the book is palpable like the the pages are almost steaming with the sweltering uh environment uh that is uh 
it, it it's rep repeatedly mentioned and I'm I was wondering about that and and why you decided to dwell on that in particular oh gosh I try to move it around I mean sometimes I have the book you know set in Montreal in the winter death du jour for example and I'm always talking about the snow and the cold and how much it's snowing and how freezing she is um, so this time I probably started the book in July or something and it was hot and I thought, okay, we're going to have it be hot this time. <laughs> I, I wondered if it was a reference to climate change, but. No, I don't think so. It, summers here are hot. Is it hot now? I guess so. If your grandchildren are swimming. It's been in the mid eighties. Um, it's a little cooler now because we got some rain, but yeah, it's, it's late May and it's in the mid eighties. There's um, the conclusion of the book, which I don't want to give away, even though I'm assuming that a lot of the people watching right now have read it, but I'm, I'm going to be very careful about how I ask this question. Um, when, you, when you set out at the beginning of the story, I'm going to assume that you knew what happened to this body and who this person was and why. But are there surprises along the way, even for you as the writer? There are always surprises because um, what I wanted, I wanted the, yes, I wanted the person, to the body, to everybody she talked to gives a different story. You know, was he a target of the government? Was he... Um, a, uh, just flat out crazy was he you know you get these totally different pictures depending on who and she's do, investigating this with skinny slidell and skinny is one of my very favorite characters in the series so you get these totally different views of him and it, it goes with this theme of you know what is real what isn't real which picture am i supposed to accept of this person so yeah i knew i knew who he was and i knew why he was dead and i knew um what had happened but as i'm researching one thing i may stumble on something else totally different it, it, you know it leads you down all these different research uh, pathways that you don't totally anticipate and then i will incorporate that in the story and there are some points in the story that 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 happened with some real estate points that that I said, really? I didn't know about that. And so that went into the book. Do you do the research simultaneously or do you do it first and then start writing? I usually decide on this is the big chunk theme of the book. Um, for example, for book number 20, I'm reading a lot about human genome editing. So I'll do that in advance. But then as I'm writing, once I start writing, I'm constantly researching. Yeah, all the time. It's, it's a it's a feedback loop kind of thing <laughs> is is there one part of the process that you prefer over the other the pro the research process or the writing process or yes oh gosh i don't know i like making up names <laughs> that's really fun i was just reading some author's interview i forget who harlan coben or someone no i don't know they said they hated no lee child maybe i hate making up names well i love making up names that's my favorite part i think can you tell us something interesting about how you made up one of the names in, in this story? Maybe Nick Body? Um, that one I wanted a name, well, there's a, an explanation. I don't want to give a spoiler on that of how. Right, he, right. Yeah. So Good point. I, I had these parameters and I, that I needed, so I made up a name that would fit with those parameters. Sometimes I just go to the obituaries for whatever place I'm writing about. If it's Charleston or Montreal or Israel or Guatemala, I, I will pull up obituaries to get appropriate. And then I'll take a first name from somebody and a last name from somebody else and create new names. And then I'll run it through Google to be sure it's not, you know, if it's a really distinct name to be sure it's not a real person. Oh, wow. That's, that's amazing. How did you come up with temperance? Um, I taught on a program years ago called Semester at Sea. It's a ship that goes around the world for a semester. It's got, I think, something like 500 students on it and faculty and crew. There's like, I don't know, 900 people totally. Anyway, you go around, and I had a student named Tempe. And I, I just like the name. And um, when I created the character, she's a good Irish Catholic 
girl. She was raised. So you'd need a proper baptismal name. So I thought, well, Tempe, all right, we'll, we'll lengthen it to temperance. It never occurred to me that when I then gave her the problem of being an alcoholic, temperance, I never thought of that. Wow. Yeah. It's so interesting, you know, that that four months ago, if you had described that, that you know, school on on water, it would have sounded amazing to me. And now it sounds like a nightmare. So yeah, it was amazing, but yeah. the world has changed. Uh, I guess uh, I should get to some of our reader questions because we have so many of them. And I realize that we are at the halfway point of our uh, chat. Uh, thank you everyone for the questions that you've sent in and you can still send them in because Patrick is going to send them to me. Uh, first, this question, well, Paul Graham sent four questions and they're all so good, but I'm, I'm going to have to at least cut a couple of them. And he asks, in one of the blurbs on the back of your novel, Brad Meltzer says, I dare you to figure out all the red herrings. Could you talk about your process um, in placing these red herrings in the story? Well, I think it's legitimate to do that. I, I think I said that already. Um, you have clues. And part of the reason people like to read murder mysteries, I think, is that they're solving a puzzle. They're trying to figure out who done it and why, because murder is one of the few crimes that you have to have a mo you don't know the motive robbery you know the motive kidnapping you know the motive but murder you don't always know them anyway so you the reader is trying to solve the puzzle and you plant clues along the way to legitimately lead them to that solution but you've also got some false herrings in there that not only misdirect the reader, but also misdirect your, your protagonist as well. And I think that's legitimate to do that as long as they make sense. And as long as you explain them, um, you can't ever rely just on coincidence. That's that's cheating. Um, yeah. So there are red herrings in there. And that's part of the job of the reader is to sort through which are the legitimate clues and which are not. And I know when I'm reading a murder mystery, uh, or a thriller, um, if I figure it out before the end, before the author gives me the answer, I'm a little disappointed in the author because their job is to surprise you that you haven't figured it out. And then when you do get there, you go, oh yeah, why didn't I see that? Yeah, here's this clue back in chapter 12 or whatever. Okay, I feel much better because I was totally fooled by one of the red herrings. I had no, and I definitely did not guess anything close to what the actual answer was. Um, so I did my thank job. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you did. You did your job. Uh, I'll just read one more of Paul's questions because they're so good. Uh, you talk in the epilogue about testing whether the potential story has the muscle to grow into a book. Can you expand on what that testing looks like? Well, it looks like when I sit down and uh, for, I start researching whatever the, that big theme of the book is, um, and then when I start to write uh, an outline, I don't do complete outlines, but I start to outline it. If I can't keep going with that outline, if I reach a point where I go, so, oh, now what? You know, so where are we going with this? Now what? Then that probably doesn't have the muscle to build into a, to a full-length novel or a story at all. Does that happen? Do you abandon stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Early, usually very early on, because I do a lot of my preliminary prep in my head. I'll think about it a long time before I even start, you know, tapping the keyboard. Okay, the next question comes from Roberta Rich, and she is uh, the author of the Midwife of Venice series, which I really enjoyed. She lives here in Vancouver. Uh, she's, she asks if you would discuss your research methods, including what resources you rely on and your method of organizing vast quantities of material. Two-part question. Um, I'm lucky because I've worked for so long in a combined crime and medical legal lab the Laboratoire de Sciences Judiciaires de Médecine Légale in Montreal, and also down here. So if I have science questions, normally I can just call one of my colleagues or walk across the, the hall, you know, and talk to someone in uh, the biology section or the fire and arson section or, you know, the bomb guys or, or whoever it happens to be. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways I do research. Um, 
I also do research on non-scientific aspects of the book, and I do a lot of that online. Um, I, I will never write a book about a place I haven't visited. So if I'm going to set it somewhere different, I go there. Um, I go to Israel, I, or I've been there. Uh, I went on a USO tour a few years back to Afghanistan just to thank our troops for being there. So I was so moved. We went to thank them, and they spent all their time thanking us. So I wrote a book using Afghanistan. I wrote a book using Guatemala. So all of that I consider part of, of my research process. And I have completely forgotten the second part of her question. Uh, she wants to know uh, your method of organizing the vast quantities of material. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> um, hmm. I, I, I do old fashioned folders. I, okay, two ways. I have hard copy where I'll put printed materials. I also keep files on the computer under, you know, of the human genome or, you know, what feral hogs or whatever, you know, it happens to be. Um, I'm feral not, hogs feral hogs yeah well that was that actually that idea came from a case of a body that was scavenged in a canadian case um a murder victim in, near um ottawa who'd been scavenged by bears so i uh, the idea of a body scavenged beyond recognition is what i took from that case and then changed it to feral hogs because that's what we have in in north carolina but i'm not um I'm not someone who does massive outlining and organizing. My son, Brendan Reichs, with whom I wrote the viral series, is also an author. He, um, he actually has a big whiteboard and color-coded cards, and he does it much like we do in the writer's room when we're breaking a story and you're breaking it down, the A story and the B story and the C story. He does it. A story, B story, C story, chapter by chapter, and for every character. And he's got color-coded cards, and he's so organized, it makes me crazy. I don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. So um, I'm not nearly that good at keeping my organizational, or my, my materials organized. Can I just quickly ask you about that USO tour? Because when we picture that, I picture like Betty Grable or someone like that, you know, some hot stuff uh yeah. starlet uh that the troops go crazy for like did you go and, and do a reading in afghanistan what what uh, happened yeah no we were not like bob hope and Anne margaret um it was five of us went brad went uh no brad went to we i've done two i did one to guantanamo in cuba and brad went on that afghanistan it was clive cussler um sandra brown myself mark bowden who wrote black hawk down which was really interesting because we spent a lot of time flying around in Black Hawk helicopters in our 40 pounds of body armor and helmets and, and you know, sitting shoulder to shoulder with Mark. Um, you know, as long as Mark was calm, I was calm. That was kind of my my, my modus operandi. So, um, yeah, we, we would go to forward, forward operating bases just to meet one on one with the troops. Um, we did some signings. If they brought books, we would sign their books. But mainly we would just, just spend time with them and chat with them. And no formal presentations. I don't think we did any. Um, yeah, but they spent all their time thanking us for coming and telling us how our books helped them get through. You know, the, you know when, when you're talking to young mothers who have left a six-month baby behind, to go serve in Afghanistan, it, you know, it was, they make quite the sacrifice over there. Wow. It's amazing. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go to a live, a couple of live questions. Uh, hello from Ottawa. This is Ruta Flexgold. Your books go into some pretty dark places. Do your friends, children, grandchildren ever comment on this, given your personality on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well, my, by now they know what I write. Um, my friends, you know, I've been writing these for 20 years. So I, I suppose initially when the first one, when Deja Dead came out, which is about a serial murderer and a dismembered, dismembered victim. Yeah, they may have been, a, but they knew what my line of business was anyway, because I was working in a forensic, in a forensic lab, identifying, you know, less than fresh bodies. Um, so I think they were aware of that. I think when they knew I was writing a book after it came out, because I didn't tell anyone while I was writing it, 
Um, I don't think they were surprised at all at the kind of book I wrote. Now, my grandkids are too young. My oldest is uh, 10. They're 10, 9, 7, 5, and 4. Does that add wow. up? Six of them? Is that? Anyway, um, part of the reason Brendan and I wrote the viral series, which features Temperance Brennan's 14 year old great niece and her three best friends who are boys is that um, first of all he was he's a lawyer and he hated being a lawyer and he was desperate not to be a lawyer so he came to me and he said why don't we write a young adult series and I said yeah okay let's do that and also because um, I would have parents say to me is it okay if my daughter reads your adult books and I'd say well how old's your daughter and she'd say seven and i'd say no it really isn't so we thought it would be a good idea to um this is getting off the topic i guess of your of your question but that's why we we thought it would be a good idea to write a, a young adult series with 14 year old uh, protagonist and and using forensic science at kind of a middle school high school level because kids are interested in it Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I was reading your book on my iPad and my 11 year old kept trying to read it with me. And then he he was surprised at some of the content and I was surprised that he was reading it. All right. Next uh, question is from Susan Collins in London, Ontario, uh, formerly from Montreal. She says, in the book, you use the term patootie a couple of times, and I wondered what it means. Years ago, I attended an Anglican church camp in the Laurentians, north of Montreal. Also, at the camp was a group of teenagers from a church in Lynchburg, Virginia, and one of the girls had a nickname of Patootie. When I saw the word in the book, it brought back a flood of memories from August 1963. Yeah, probably not the same reference, Patootie. I think the way I'm using it in the book is like, uh, like tush. It's, it's a slang, a soft slang term. I think her mother, is her mother use it maybe? Just a very soft way of referencing one's derriere. I um, I loved your expression. Well, you you wrote it. Tempe said it. Uh, Sweet Jesus in a romper. You, did you make that up? I think I did. Yeah. I've, it's a very you know. I live in the South. We hear you know Sweet Jesus on a bicycle or Sweet Jesus in an apple tree or you know. So one, why not a romper? Why not they're a romper? Very, they're very in right now. Um, Okay, this question is from Glenn in Mississauga. He asks, for the next novel, any thoughts of having Temperance Brennan perform her forensic investigative work under COVID-19 conditions? Being Canada's hotspot, Montreal would be the ideal setting. Well, interestingly, the next book will, <laughs> two points there, will take place um, largely in Montreal. She'll be back up there. And um, second point is that it will have to do with um, a contagious uh, disease that goes out of control. Great. And that's all okay. about it. <laughs> do, you have, do you have a title for it yet? Yes, I think we're going with the, bo uh, the Bone Code. The Bone Code. Very good. Uh, next question is from Dale Churchward. When your first novel, Deja Dead, was published in 1997, the mystery crime genre was, as I recollect, seen as something of a subgenre. What is your view of how mystery crime fiction and its reception have changed in the last 20 plus years? Well, I, my understanding is it's one of the biggest uh, genres in publishing. Um, thrillers, well, romance thrillers and young adults are booming. So I think the biggest change over the last 20 years or so is that like my book, many, all of them now give lip service, at least you have to have the medical examiner or the coroner. There's at least tipping your hat to forensic science. And many of them are, you know, it's a central theme in the book that the solution is driven by science. And I think that's a new, it's not just legwork by cops or private investigation, private investigators or gut instinct or, you know, it's, there's science involved. And I th probably TV has a lot, had a, has had a lot to do with that, including bones. Yeah, I think it all, well, maybe, maybe, but it all sort of started at the same time, I think, back in the, in the mid nineties somewhere where CSI came on and then bones came on and uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think TV is, yeah. 
Okay, thank you for that question, Dale. Uh, this is uh, from one of our viewers right now. Melissa McClawhorn Fish is asking, can you talk about identifying remains at the World Trade Center? Yeah, that was yeah. tough. Um, I was deployed there with, uh, it's an, it's called, um, more, ha, ah, it's a, it's a network, a national network here of, um, teams that are deployed in cases of mass fatalities. The network exists, it's called DMOR, Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams. And it exists permanently, but it's only activated in cases of mass disaster with mass fatalities. And usually you work within your own district. It's like FEMA districts, you know, emergency management districts here in the US. But 9-11 was so huge, number one. And number two, nobody could get there. Initially, you couldn't fly there. You couldn't rent a car to get there. So we were deployed. Everyone was deployed from wherever they were that could get to New York. So I went I went in early in one of the very early waves. And I um, that was tough. We worked 13 hour shifts. Um, I was primarily initially at Ground Zero, but I was primarily at the um, Staten Island landfill where everything was being transported. And we had to wear these big suits and, you know, breathing apparatus and goggles and masks. And um, they would bring the materials out there by truck and then they would go on these um, conveyor belts that would kind of separate the big stuff from the smaller stuff. And then um, we would sort through it and determine what was human um, because we were finding a lot of animal bone because there were restaurants in the Twin Towers, there were catering services, whatever. Anyway, we had to decide, yes, it's bone, yes, it's human bone. And then every day the medical examiner would send the van, we would tag it and bag it and, you know, idea, and uh, then they would take it. There were very few identifications done because everything was so fragmentary. And then it was later done through DNA analysis. Oh my goodness. Do you think the writing of these books, which deal with dark subject matter, but they're also funny, uh, do you think that helps you deal with your day to day with your day job? Well, I think so. And that, you know, the reason I went with, and I do put humor in the books and that's important to me. Um, and it, that's that's a tough that's a tightrope that you it's a very delicate balancing act. How do you put it in? Because every book deals with violent death how do you put humor in there? And it's the same thing for Bones. The region, I'd had a number of offers, but the reason I went with this particular, with Hart Hansen, Canadian, also Tamara Taylor is Canadian. She played uh, Cam. Um, the reason I went with them is that they saw that too, the importance of humor, and they wanted to put humor into the show as well. They actually coined a phrase, they call this the first crimity on television. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so yeah, so I do put humor into uh, the books, we put it into the show, but you have to be very um, careful with it, sensitive. And it, all, and it comes from character, right? There's an amazing scene, I'll, I'll, I promise I'm getting to more questions, but there's an amazing scene in the book where um, they're having this very deep discussion uh, about um, the case over lunch. And in the middle of it, I think they're having a ham and cheese sandwich, maybe. And it, in the middle of it, Tempe says, did you put beets in here? And then they start having a discussion about the merits of beets in a sandwich. And it was just perfect. So they, I enjoyed that. Yeah. They, 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 yeah, they have quite a give and take, those two. Although I will say beets do not belong anywhere near a sandwich. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Okay, here's a question from George Oliver. What disappoints or surprises you most about the way in which police investigate murder cases? Oh, wow, that's a good one. Um, I'm not sure anything surprises me. Um, sometimes what will surprise me, because I work the part of the, I'm part of a team and everybody contributes to these investigations. Not everything I do is criminal keep in mind, but on criminal cases, um, I work with the, the part, the, the evidence I work with is the dead, the dead, the dead person, him or herself. So I will do my analysis. I will give that to the investigating officer 
the investigating officer then works with people who are analyzing hair and fiber or people who are you know analyzing a bite mark or whatever they put it all together they pursue their investigation with whatever leads they have so often what surprises me is later when i find out how the investigation went because unlike the character in my book i'm not really involved in that part of it i'm not out on the street asking questions with the investigating officer so do you do some research by talking to police uh when you're oh, writing the books yeah i have cops that help me all the time i have you know two or three that i go to they're kind of my go-to guys they answer questions for me all the time like is there a safety on a glock nine on a policeman's gun i know there's no safety on a regular gun but you know the cops sometimes modify them and put a safety on. so that kind of little detail that i like to have correct just like you were looking at the details uh for the scripts of bones right even for all the episodes you weren't you didn't write right you did that sort of check right um here's a question from alan broom who is a retired medical doctor uh from Kelowna, bc uh he says thank you for creating temperance and her continuing career including the canadian content i was wondering if the infamous robert willie picton was in this novel i i don't think he's in this novel i don't I think he is, but there's certainly that pig link, I guess. I hadn't thought of him when I chose to have it be feral hogs. Um, yeah, there's also a pig scene, isn't there, in, is it Silence of the Lambs or? Is yeah. Silence of the Lambs? There's pig. another, yeah. Feeding bodies to pigs. So pigs, you know, they get a bad rap. <laughs> Hope no one's eating a yeah. bacon sandwich right now. Yeah. with beets um would you do you take um would you consider writing uh, about a case like that i mean that is so dark and that was such an awful awful tragedy here in bc well, yeah i don't do true true crime there's a whole genre of true crime i don't do that um but the picton case i think has been well covered by people writing true crime this is a question from Marsha, not me, different Marsha. Uh, what procedures, oh, this is interesting. What procedures or steps has your profession had to introduce to address situations involving transgender victims or those who have undergone gender reassignment? For example, remains of a biological male are found, but official documentation, such as a driver's license or passport, is for a female reported missing. Yeah, and we've had cases like that. Um, there are some things that you can't change, some things in the skeleton that you can't change um, that are fairly telltale of gender. Even if that person who's undergone the, the transformation has taken um, hormone, hormones and, and whatever, drug therapy, um, there are certain things that, you know, the, the, the shape of the pelvis, uh, the size of the hands, those kinds of things are not going to, the, the bony parts of the body are not going to change. This question is from Karen Von Reenen. Do you ever miss your career pre-writing? Um, my career pre-writing, I'm not sure there was a time. I've always written. It's just what I wrote that shifted. Because um, as we learn in that story, I mentioned First Bones. Tempe started out as an academic teaching university and her PhD, like mine, was in bioarchaeology. So she was doing research in bioarchaeology. So you always write. Um, I wrote textbooks, however. I wrote journal articles. I wrote nonfiction until I decided to shift and start writing fiction. So yes, at that point, when the second book came out, I did go on leave from the university. And um, that was like around the year 1999, 2000, and I never went back to teaching. So in that sense, sometimes I do miss teaching. I do miss working with students, but that's compensated for by when you go on tour and you get to meet your readers and you get to interact with them. Um, and I do give lectures um, periodically, which is a form of teaching, I guess. Do you miss casework? I do miss casework. Um, it's funny, I guess... Uh, I'm never happy, I guess, is the answer to that. Because when I'd have a deadline for a book and I'd be working hard on the book and I'd get a call to go into the lab, I'd think, well, I don't have time for this. And then 
if two or three weeks would go by and I didn't get a call from the lab, I'd think, well, what the heck? Why aren't they calling me in? To, to, you know, so there's just no pleasing me, I guess. You and everybody else. <laughs> Kathy Reich, she's just like us. Um, here's a question from Rachel W. How did you get to the place of writing a book? Did you always want to write? Okay, so we know that you you have always written, but how did you get to the, that place of writing fiction? Yeah, writing fiction. Um, a couple things came together in 1994. Um, I made full professor at the university, which is the highest rank you can attain. So really beyond that you can do whatever you want you, you don't have to keep cranking out pu public anyway you you have more freedom and also i had just worked on the uh, murder case the serial murder case in montreal so i had a good basis for a story i had the freedom to try something new um and i had a colleague who was writing directly to paperbacks and she was writing romances western romances so i read one and i I thought, well, I think I can do this. I think I can do better than this. So I, yeah, I decided I would, um, I would write a book. So, a colleague at the university who was writing Western romances. Yes. Oh, in the forensic anthropology no. department. No. no. Okay. Cultural anthropologist. Okay. Wow. Um, uh, this is a question from Stephanie Best Gaudet. Um, she she's about halfway through Conspiracy of Bones, and it intended to research MK Ultra as I wasn't sure if it was fictional or not. Hard to believe it really happened. Did it really happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This, this is when the screen goes black again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, what? Oh, this is a question. Oh, this is from Patrick, our our own Patrick, who's making sure that we continue on smoothly. Uh, what authors, past or present, do you read? Oh, wow! I read all over the place. Um, currently, I am, and I always go blank when someone asks me this. Um, currently, I'm reading *The Cuckoo's Calling*, which is J.K. Rowling's uh, adult mystery detective series. Um, before that, what did I read? Um, oh, before that, I read uh, The Testaments, Margaret Atwood's follow-up to Handmaid's Tale. Wonderful, wonderful series, or duo, I guess she's done. Um, I read a lot of thrillers because I want to know what my colleagues are doing out there. I don't want to start, you know, get 100 pages into a manuscript and figure out that, you know, Dennis Lehane just wrote about human genome editing or something. So I like the grittier stuff, the darker stuff. I like Michael Connolly. I like Dennis Lehane. I like Harlan Coben. I like Karen Slaughter. Um, there, I, I named quite a few, right? Do, do you, are you able to read while you're writing? Yes, I do, yeah. Well, not simultaneously, but when I knock off. <laughs> That would just be weird, Kathy. That would be just weird, yeah. Um, I should say that Margaret Atwood uh, is really the person who started this book club. It wasn't a virtual book club initially, uh, but she uh, wanted, uh, she worked with the Globe and Mail to start this book club, and she chose uh the White Bone, actually, isn't that interesting, uh, as uh, the novel that she wanted to talk about, and she did the interview, so yeah. it could have been Margaret Atwood interviewing you, sorry, it's just me. <laughs> I will tell you a secret about oh. Margaret Atwood. Let's hear I it. took her on a tour of the morgue. She wanted to see our facility, so I did. I took her on it. I was very nervous about it. You know, oh my God, what if she faints and I've killed Margaret Atwood or a Canadian treasure? You know, but she found it fascinating. She loved it. She did not want to go to lunch after we left. But she said she she found it very interesting and enjoyed it. Wow! It, so this was mm -hmm. this was the lab in Montreal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. What what yeah. was uh, what did you chat about? Oh, I don't know. I mean, we'd had dinner the night before and it came up and she said she wanted to see it. So I said, yeah, OK. Wonderful. And um, what women chat about. I don't know. In, in a morgue. Yeah. Well, there I was probably explaining and giving the, you know, the tour. 
Well, listen, I want to thank you very much for your time because we're just about at an hour. And I also want to thank you for the diversion because it was really great for me to read your book in the middle of this pandemic. And, you know, I'm fortunate, I'm healthy, I'm employed, um, but it's hard on all of us. And I found that your book was a lovely escape. And I, I know that's weird to escape into darkness, but I really did enjoy that. So thank, thank you, you, Kathy. Thank you. And thank you thank for you. this time. Thank you. And, and now I'll hand it back to Patrick Dell. That was fantastic. Uh, thanks, Marsha. I enjoyed that immensely. And thanks, Kathy, as well. Uh, because this is a virtual book club, I'm going to trigger a virtual round of applause. Fan <laughs> fantastic. And uh, I, I look forward to uh, picking up uh, your latest book, uh, Kathy. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned uh, patootie. It's a new word. I'll have to add that to my vocabulary uh, for the re remainder of the week. Uh, and uh, I'll say goodnight to you both and i'll wrap up wrap up the stream thanks a lot uh, for your time kathy and thanks a lot for a fantastic com conversation Marsha. well Thank thanks you. thanks guys thanks for joining us tonight it's been a pleasure uh hosting this and i hope you enjoyed uh, hearing from kathy uh you can uh, watch a full replay of our conversation on uh the globe website at tgam.ca slash book club and there'll be some more information there and Marsha will have more in uh, this saturday's globe online and in print about uh, a conspiracy of bones uh thanks for joining us it's been a fantastic pleasure chatting to you uh, i hope everyone is well and safe and take care all the best good night Thank you.